Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Felicia Hyland and I'm the coordinator of equity and engagement for the school division. We host these academies as an opportunity to learn from, um, with our families and provide strategies that support student development. Tonight's topic, Cultivating Your Child's Talent at Home, will be presented by Dr. Ann Colorado, our coordinator of gifted education services. Thank you, Dr. Colorado, for joining us and, and sharing some of the practical evidence-based strategies that families can use at home to nurture their child's curiosity and creativity in order to help their learning strengths emerge. As we go through the presentation tonight, feel free to put questions in the chat. We will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, and so, you know, I'll just monitor that and then we'll come to those after Dr. Colorado finishes her presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Car Colorado and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Highland. And um, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to talk to everybody about one of my passion areas, which is talent development. Uh, my background is in gifted education. I was a gifted resource teacher in all kinds of configurations for a good 18 years. Um, and then I was in different administrative roles, everything from school improvement specialist to an assistant principal at an elementary school and a high school. And now this is my second year as coordinator of gifted education here in WJCC public schools. I'm also a parent of three sons and all three of them either were in the WJCC gifted program and my last one still is in it um, as a high schooler. Uh, but this presentation isn't really about gifted education. It is about talent development, although it plays a role in gifted education. Uh, I want to talk to you about what you can do as parents to develop and nurture your child's talent and strength areas. So in the short time that we have together, I thought we could accomplish these things. The first thing I thought we could talk about is just the concept of talent, um, explain how curiosity and creativity function as building blocks of talent, give you some mindsets and strategies that you could use at home with your child and their talent development journey, provide resource ideas for you, and then allow time for some questions and answers. So we need to start by defining the concept of talent. And I found a perfect little video that will help us think about that. Interestingly, it was created by an advertising agency and it's really about gender and talent, but it fits our needs tonight perfectly. So let's take a listen. And please, um, Dr. Hyland, give me a signal if you cannot hear this sound. I would define talent as a natural ability or power. It's the one thing you do better than anybody else. An undeniable, distinguishable skill set that I think separates the extraordinary from the ordinary. It's almost a passion that people um, feel is authentic to them. It comes from within. Talent is about the possibility of how talented you can become. In everything, in how you live your life, how you deal with people. And you can discover it anywhere. What does talent look like? It's black, it's white, it's yellow, it's green. I think it looks like someone being themselves. There's something intangible in all of us that lives inside of us that's sometimes screaming to come out. It's just a matter of are they in the right environment where their talent can grow and, and can they be inspired. You were born palm tree, you were born in Minnesota, you probably wouldn't, you know, reach your potential until you moved down to Florida. Yes, you have to have the aptitude that you're born with. The rest of it is persistence and will and... Patience and love for what you do most. It takes a lot more hard work. It needs time to establish its own value, its own style. But we have to train it and grow it to make it even greater. So you have to get working. Talent's greatest enemy is fear. 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 It's fear of being made fun of. It's fear of being laughed at. It's fear of losing your job. You're afraid your talent won't shine. What talent needs to survive and thrive, I think, is an environment that is conducive to what you're trying to accomplish. It needs leaders who are willing to keep the barbarians 
and that an unbelievably positive environment that's inclusive and celebratory of everybody's individuality. Where failure is viewed as only a stepping stone to greatness. A place where you think you can come and do the best work of your life. That kind of environment will make the most amazing things happen. my presentation in a nutshell. <laughs> now, I'm, in all seriousness, um, there is a lot of research about talent and talent development out there. Um, for our purposes tonight, I'd like us to think of talent as something in which we have a strong ability or affinity for. And talent and the potential for talent exists in all walks of life, in all areas. Um, there are many debates in the research about um, nature versus nurture with talent and talent development, but based on the research I've done um, for this presentation, as well as in my coursework for my doctorate and for my dissertation, um, we can pretty much settle on the fact that talent can be developed and that the combination of at least average ability and intelligence, exposure to the field of interest, instruction in that field, and effort will really make the difference of developing a strength area or a passion into a true talent um, area. And so we'll talk more about that when we get to the resources part of this presentation. So let's dive a little bit more into the concept of talent. And I want to share two truths and an opinion with you. Um, truth number one, there are different areas of talent. Um, one of the big researchers in this area, John Feldhusen, suggests that talent can fall into four broad categories. The arts, the academics or intellectual, intellectual realm, the vocational realm, or the social or interpersonal area. Um, personally, I would add athletics to that as well. Um, but basically any area you think of can be a talent area. Truth number two is that all of these talent areas have a trajectory. And that research goes back to Benjamin Bloom in the mid eighties who um, undertook a study of many, many, many eminent people in different fields um, in, in around the country and around the world and interviewed these eminent people and discovered that all of these talent areas um, could be traced back to a beginning point, the beginning of a trajectory. And then they followed along a, a particular path to become what they ended up becoming. And you might have probably seen this in the sports world um, and in the music world, because there are a lot of very well-defined talent trajectories for different sports and different musical instruments um, that people play. Um, and then the last thing is an opinion. So this is my opinion based on my own personal experience with my children, with all the students I've taught over um, all these years, um, and all the research that I've done for different areas of study with my degrees. But I truly believe that every child has a talent area. It, it might be something obscure, but everybody's good at something. And um, I really truly believe this and I've never been disproven of that. Um, maybe one day I will turn it into a research study. But the trick is figuring out what your child is good at and then cultivating it so it can become their passion area. So let's look at what I consider the building blocks of talent, curiosity and creativity. According to Google's Oxford language database, curiosity is a strong desire to know or learn something. Basically, curiosity is about wanting to learn, and this is a necessary ingredient for talent development. Different researchers have linked curiosity to things such as creativity, happiness, academic achievement, motivation, among other things. And other researchers have linked the curiosity that parents cultivate at home to talent development in children and adults. 
for creativity, we need to remember that creativity is more than the arts. It's more than drawing something or, or singing a song. Creativity is related to developing our talents when we think about those those imaginative and, and, and different ideas. Thinking outside of the box is probably something we've all heard about, but stoking kids' imaginations and pushing them to think of things in new and different ways. All of that falls under creativity. So creativity of thought and um, creativity can allow children to really come up with some innovative ideas. And one day those ideas could maybe transform their talent area. Um, as an aside, I found it really interesting how many articles and even research level papers there were about curiosity and creativity from the business world. So just in my basic Google searching, which I, I tend to do when I wanna start a research area, um, just see what's out there on Google um, under academic papers and things, there's a lot in the business world. Um, about creativity, talent development, curiosity. So it made me realize that everything you do at home to cultivate your, your child's talent areas really going to help them one day in the real world in whatever their career might end up being. So you're really supporting their future selves. And to take it one step further, um, it is important to note that everything you do at home to help your child develop their talent also relates to what we call um, the five C's that we focus on um, as part of our instruction in the state of Virginia. Citizenship, creative thinking skills, communication skills, collaboration skills, and critical thinking skills. So these are things that are infused into all grade levels, all subject matter, um, all the way through kids K through 12 educational experience and talent development, um, curiosity and creativity play right into that. So by doing this, we're really preparing our kids for the future. Let's take a little closer look at that talent development trajectory. Um, as I said, researchers have shown that there's usually a path for every talent area when we're really going to develop that path. And it begins with exposure and it ends with the expertise or eminence in the field. And so the instruction and practice phases are really, um, they usually continue for many, many years. And there's an eminent um, researcher in this field. Um, his name is Erickson. And he has put forth the idea of 10,000 hours of practice, the 10,000 hour rule. You might've heard that before. Um, so the talent trajectory uh, track really spends a lot of time with instruction and practice. And we get to the point of being a practitioner in that field and then actually transforming the field is the expertise or eminence um, level. We're adding something new to the field that was never there before. Um, but what we're really talking about in this presentation is the very beginning of a talent development path, the exposure and the nurturing that you could do at home um, and that we do in school. But I, I do need to say that exposure and nurturing can start at any age. Um, I could decide to take up tennis, you know, at 51 years old. My first ex could be the, my exposure at this age. And I probably will never get to eminence, but I might get to the point where I'm really good with practicing and um, maybe even become a practitioner as, you know, on the little local competitive circuit that we have here in W in Williamsburg. So um, you don't have to start everything um, as a child. You can be exposed to things when you're older and develop um, those talents as well. Personally, I don't see the goal of um, talent development in schools as being expertise or eminence. I see the goal of talent development as um, helping kids find their strength areas and getting into the classes that will support them and give them as much background knowledge and growth as possible so they're ready um, to go into a career or a passion area or um, a college major um, prepared well from school. So what can you do at home? I'm gonna give you two different to-do lists 
The first one is um, I'm calling habits and habits of mind. And the second one will be more like action steps. So number one um, is what I consider the foundational work of um, any kind of talent development is talking to, questioning, and discussing things with your child at all times and encouraging them to talk and question you and discuss. Um, and this goes back to when I was pregnant with my first child and um, back in 1994 and read that classic book, um, What to Expect When You're Expecting. And there was just a tiny little blurb in there that said, you'll really help your child's brain development if you talk to your child all the time, even if they cannot talk back and have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> just the constant talking to them will help them, you know, kind of develop the acceptance of language and the readiness for language when um, you know they can put that all together in their little brains. So I say never pass up an opportunity to talk and um, don't squash your kids questions when they ask you questions. I know sometimes we're so busy, you got a million things on your mind and you don't want to explain why the sky is blue right now. But, <laughs> um, you know, try to channel, try to channel those questions and encourage them because that's a sign of curiosity. And um, as kids get older, you know, you can switch the commentary that I was talking about when my old, when my oldest child was like three months old, I'd have him propped in a walker with a bunch of blankets. So he was right next to me while I was cooking. And I just described everything I was doing. Um, when we would drive down the street, I would talk about everything we saw. But eventually he got old enough that he could talk back. Um, not always, you know, in the in the good way, but I mean, as a conversation. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, we turned into discussions that were more related to elementary school, like what's going on in school or around the house. And then as they got into middle and high school, we could start talking more about um, current events and things like that, their thoughts and feelings. Number two, another habit, reading every day, and not just you telling your child to read, but you also reading and modeling for them um, that, that um, people who are learning, especially in their talent area, are also readers or um, listeners of text. So, you know, nowadays you can have books on um, record, you can um, have documents be read to you by clicking a button on the, on the internet, you know. So um, in K-4, it's great if you can read aloud to your child. Um, and even in fifth grade, some, it could go either way, it depends on your child, but five through 12, you can have book clubs with your kid where you're both reading the same book, but then you have periodic meetings, maybe, you know, over a soda, um, a special time, you know, that you can spend together and talk about the book. Number three is what I called be a strength detective, but then when I dug into my research, I found out there was a name for it called a talent scout, um, where you're really trying to notice what your child is good at. Um, my youngest son, who is a freshman now in high school, um, I have a funny story about him along these lines we were at a baby shower for my cousin and we played a game all of us got to play not just the women um where you had to write a piece of advice on an index card to the new you know the new parents and um then they had to guess who gave them the advice well he gave the best advice of the night according to everybody who was there and nobody even guessed it was from him because it was so wise for his age but he said, the best thing you can do for your child is, is find out what they're good at and then let them do it all the time. <laughs> and um, at the time he was into baseball. So we were doing a lot of things with baseball, but that's kind of the same idea. We knew he loved baseball. So we put him in opportunities to grow that area, that talent. Um, and and um, you know, it was really good for him. Of course, now he's decided to move to football, but anyway. You get the idea, um, find out what they're good at and try to encourage it. Number four is what I call a habit of mind. And this is, this has been going around in education for a few years, but it really goes back a lot further than that. Um, it's called a growth mindset 
If we teach our children to have a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset, they're going to be in a better state of mind for growing a talent area. Um, so what's the difference? A growth mindset, we, we all have beliefs within ourselves subconsciously about intelligence. We either have a fixed mindset where we believe intelligent is, intelligence is fixed and we can't change it. It is what it is. I was born this way. That's the way it is. Or we have a growth mindset where we believe that intelligence can change and that we can impact it and we can grow our intelligence and, um, and learn from that. So um, having that growth mindset really goes far in helping our kids um, grow their talents. And it, it really goes far in all areas also, not just talent development, but any area for school, of course, any endeavor they're trying to learn. Along with that growth mindset goes um, this, this idea of mistakes or opportunities for learning. Um, it's okay to fail. You saw in that video how all those people said failure was basically the antithesis of talent development. Um, but if kids are too afraid to even try anything, then they're not going to be able to grow their talent. So we have to help them realize it's okay to fail. Um, and we learn from our mistakes um, because failure will get in the way of us growing our passion areas. Along with the growth mindset, go to sub skills, goal setting where um, we can teach kids how to set a measurable goal to attain what it is they want to do. If they love tennis and they want to become a, a tennis player at the high school level, well, what are the things you can do every day to get you there and help them break down that goal and then help them learn how to analyze that goal. Did I meet that? There's little sub steps or not. If not, maybe I need to adjust my sub steps or maybe I need to adjust my goal. Um, it's a life skill, but it's very, very important for talent development to know how to do that. The other thing is to start reinforcing self-management skills with our kids, even at young ages. Teach them how to make lists to keep track of what they have to do. Teach them how to use a timer so they can um, stay focused on the work they have. Teach them how to use a planner so they can plan out all of those little sub-steps for their goals. Um, so they can learn how to manage their church commitments, their school commitments, their passion area commitments, the, the things they want to do for that. Um, those skills will help with talent development as well as life. The next list are the activities that um, kind of branch out from those habits and habits of mind. Um, the first one, of course, very related to the talking to your child, encouraging the talk and doing the reading is get the library card. It is free and the world is at their fingertips with the library. Um, nowadays, they have um, all those audible books. They have all the magazines you can think of. Anything they can think of in their passion area, they can find um, support materials at the library to really help them learn as much as they can about whatever it is they're interested in. Encourage them to get nonfiction as well as fiction books. Encourage them to do some of the free activities at the library. Um, in youth services, they have um, kits, um, kind of like makerspace type of kits that they, you can check out and the kids can do at home. They have book clubs built in a bag where you, know, you can check out the book club for your child and their friends and they can all do a book club. They have uh, not right now because of COVID, but they do have things where you come in and you build Lego things or you do Harry Potter, like all those kinds of different things. The director of youth services at our Williamsburg Regional Library used to be the media specialist at Norge Elementary. So she has really grown youth services program to extend what we do in school and to help kids build their passion areas. Um, take local field trips. And when I say local, I mean, it could be your backyard or park. I mean, we do have a wealth of resources in the Hampton Roads area of places where you can go. And a lot of those places are free or very low cost, but you can turn anything into a field trip. Um, and 
if you add some higher level thinking questions or go to a place where your child um, it, that's related to your child's passion area, then you can really um, take off from there and um, just turn it into an experience and not just a place to go. Um, number three, find a more knowledgeable other. When you know what your child is really interested in, um, and I'll use a very easy example, um, let's say colonial history. <laughs> we are in the crib of colonial history. So you know there are lots of more knowledgeable others. That's what Dr. Tamara Stambot Vanderbilt calls it, where you can bring your child to learn from an expert, ask questions from this expert, get direction and guidance from the expert. But really with the internet, the way things are now, you can find experts in every field that your child um, has a talent for and, and read about that person, connect with that person through email with your permission or your assistance. Um, you can do online um, visits to their work area. Maybe it's a, it's a um, museum docent at the Louvre for, and your child um, likes to paint in the impressionist style. Like there's a, there's a lot of ways to tap the knowledge of somebody um, more um, in the field than we are as, a, as on our path of nurturing and exposure. Number four is a big one, um, especially in the creativity field. We need to give kids downtime every day. Um, it's hard for us as adults. It's hard for me as a person to even give myself downtime. So this is a constant struggle, I think, in our society. <laughs> um, but for kids, if we can enforce some downtime every day, that gives their mind that incubation time. Um, where they can really just sit and think and do nothing, or they could read if they want, or they could build, or they could draw, or um, test out a design that they have. But um, that downtime is really important, not only to allay stress and anxiety that we see far too often in our kids in school nowadays, but um, to encourage them to think in their talent area. Um, my middle son, I'll tell you a quick little story about him. He now um, has a marine engineering degree with a minor in nuclear engineering from the United States Merchant Marine Academy and um, finished his first job working on a Maersk ocean, um, Maersk cargo ship as a um, third class engineer in the engine room. But way, way back when he was a little kid, and I can remember it starting in second grade, he was fascinated with ships. And so he wanted to know about the Titanic. I don't even know how, if he learned about it at school or what, but we went through this huge Titanic period and he built models with Legos about Titanic and you know this and that, everything Titanic. But when he got into middle school, he had a lot of downtime because I was working on my doctorate. So I wasn't home um, all summer like I had normally been kind of monitoring and programming um, all of their time during the day. But he spent every day while I was away from work watching um, World War II documentaries and building his own ships out of aluminum siding that my father-in-law gave him with a little um, hand riveter so that he can wrap them in duct tape and aluminum foil and test their floatability, how far they he could push them in the bathtub, how long they would stay afloat, all of those different things, because he had all this time on his hands to just explore what he was interested in. And then look what he ended up doing. <laughs> I just think, you know, that's a great story of the incubation time. So I'm not going to say he was unstructured all summer. I will say he was incubating all of that summer. Um, so number five, I'm sure many of you already do this, but signing up your kids for clubs and community activities, all of those things, especially at schools, a lot of the schools offer free clubs as it is, and those are ways that kids can really develop their talent areas and passions, but through these free clubs, um, encourage real world problem solving. In our houses every day, um, in our daily lives, we deal with problems all day long. What are we going to have for dinner? <laughs> how am I going to get the car fixed? Um, how am I going to buy that PS5 that all my friends got and I wanted to? Like, those are real world kind of problems. And we can teach our kids how to logically think through those. That 
practice with problem solving just helps them in their talent development area, especially if they get to the point of practitioner and need to solve problems in their talent area. Um, contests and competitions are another way that we can encourage our students, um, our children with their um, challenge areas, their um, talent areas and passion areas. A lot of contests are school based. Um, if you look them, you know, look for contests online, a lot of them say you have to have a school based team. And we do have some competition teams. I know at high school we do. <laughs> Uh, designing a ship was one of the ones that my son did in um, his CAD drawing class at um, high school and um, the one who I was just telling you about. So there, there are things like that in our schools, but there are also some that are individual. And um, on my website, the WJCC gifted webpage, we have some suggestions on there. Um, there are community enrichment opportunities is what I'm gonna call them. But what I really mean is that's when you get into the camps and the classes. And um, that's where sometimes you end up having to spend some money. Uh, although most of the camps and classes in our area do have um, scholarships or sliding fee scales, sliding scale fees. So there's ways around it. Um, uh, but sometimes the, the deeper kids get sometimes into their talent areas, you end up maybe spending some more money like if a kid gets into guitar you know you've got <laughs> the equipment that you buy and then lessons and all that so just depends how much what how deep your child wants to get into those passion areas this one um might be surprising to you as a parent action but it, it's really important it's and it's okay to share your child's talent area with your child's teacher like your child's teacher is your your partner um, whether you realize it or not, it's a partnership. You, your child, and the teacher, the three of you are partners. So the more that you share with the teacher about your child, then the teacher can try to incorporate building that strength area in school as well through his or her teachings. And then number 10 is kind of a no brainer, but I wanted 10 on my list. So I'm put it there anyway. Um, <laughs> support your child in all endeavors. I, you know, I do, you know, I know I'm making a little bit of a joke, but we do read stories about, you know, people who become eminent in a field, overcoming the odds. They like, maybe they were, you know, an orphan or they, they didn't have parents that supported them or whatever, and they still made it. But those are rare stories, I think. The more we can support our kids, even if we don't like, you know, um, whatever instrument is they're playing or whatever kind of crazy passion area they have, maybe it's koi fish and you're like, I do not want a fish pond in my house, but oh my gosh, they love koi fish. What am I going to do? You know, whatever it is, try to support them and they'll go farther in their talent area. So a few resources, I just want to quickly show you and I will have to do a new share here. So if you give me just a second to let that work. Um, this is the website. Dr. Highland, can you see the website? Okay. So if you go to the WJCC website and you go to academics, and then you go over to gifted education. Hopefully you can still see that. Um, down toward the bottom, we've got resources for you and for your student. So there, here's a place where you can find some things that could help you help your child develop their passion area. You do not have to be an identified gifted student to go on this website <laughs> or to um, get ideas from Gifted World. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, is it back on Dr. Highland? All right. So your child's teacher, I did talk about that already, but there are some questions you can ask your child's teacher about your child's strength area. Let's say your ninth grader is, or your eighth grader, whatever grader really is like really into writing. They keep a journal, they publish their own stories. They do this little blog where they share their writing. 
So you talk to the child's teacher and, and you share that information, but you also can ask, have you noticed this in class? What kinds of things are you able to do to challenge my child in writing? Do you think they're so far beyond their other classroom peers that they might benefit from the gifted program? So your child's teacher can help you explore those type of questions and then take you through that process if you think that is something that your child needs based on their strengths that they're showing. The last little resource I want to share with you, and I don't have access to the chat, so Dr. Highland, I don't know if you do and if you wanted to add this, but um, there are two books I'm going to suggest that parents read, and they are very user-friendly books, um, even though they're well-researched books by people eminent in the field of um, talent development and growth mindset and, and um, that kind of thing, but one is called Grit by Angela Duckworth, and the other is called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And um, Grit talks about how as long as you have the average intelligence and ability, your hard work can make the difference. And that's a lot of times where we see a separation with kids who might have an ability in a certain area but they don't put in the effort and the hard work. You can't just rest on your laurels. Oh, I'm really good at math, so I'm going to just keep taking the hardest math classes ever. Well, you get to a point where you can't just get by on your regular what I know about math, and you have to put in a lot of effort and work. And not, not everybody wants to put in that effort and work. And it's okay. It just depends on the situation. So those are things you can learn about, read about, and explore and help your child figure out when is it important for me to put in that effort and when is it okay to just put the, the regular effort. Um, to ever get strong in a talent area, you've got to put in a lot of effort and hard work. Um, it just doesn't come easy. And then Mindset by Carol Dweck will teach you more about the growth versus fixed mindset and things we can do as educators and parents to really help grow our kids growth mindsets at home. All right, so that is it. I hope um, you were able to take away some nuggets from that. And um, Dr. Highland, are there any questions? Yes, we do have a question. Can you help us to better understand the difference between habits and habits of mind? Mm -hmm. Well, a habit, I just considered it as something that you do like all the time. And a habit of mind is more of your mindset and the way you think about things. That's kind of um, how I was distinguishing those two. And they're both very important. So like the talking to our children all the time and encouraging the questioning. That's a habit. That's something we can do and you do it over and over. And it's just the way it is. Like that's how it is in this house. We talk, we can, you know, you can ask me questions. I'm gonna answer them. Those are habits. But um, the habit of mind is like actually shifting how we think about something. And um, you can reinforce it with a habit, you know, so, let's just say some people might decide we're going to do affirmations every day that I don't know it yet, but I will. Like if your child says, I hate math, I'm just not a math person. Well, you just don't know math yet, but we will. And so you're kind of working on that shit, that mind shift, but then you could reinforce it with a habit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Thank you. You're welcome. So how do you help a child who says, I don't know what I like? How do you help them to find that talent? Uh, yeah, well, I think the best way to help them there is to expose them to lots of different things. And it might take years. I mean, sometimes it could be like upper middle school before a kid, like really, maybe even high school before they find that thing, like that one thing. And I would venture to say, we have kids who even don't find that thing until they go to college. You know, it just, it's just a matter of sometimes luck about falling, you know, into the thing and, and encountering the thing that you really like, or, um, you know, just, just exposure and trying lots of new things. Um, and that will help. 
All right. So we don't have any other questions in the chat. I guess I, um, a question I would have, Dr. Colorado, when you have a child who has a talent that they love, but they may not necessarily be very good at that talent, it, is that something you continue to nurture and encourage? Do you encourage exposure to other things? How do you handle those situations? Mm -hmm. I would say you would never want to, I, I wouldn't want to squash a child's passion, even if they're not very good at it. The more you do something, the better you're going to get. Like if it's an actual skill thing, like I know I talk about tennis a lot. I think I do want to take up tennis, actually, the more I talk about it. But like, let's say it's tennis. They just love it, but they stink. Like they're horrible. But you know what? <laughs> Over time, if they keep trying and if you get them the right instruction, which actually there's a master class, if you've ever heard of master class, um, that was one of my Christmas presents from my husband on, on like how to play tennis. And it's from Venus, you know, who is like the like one of the world best tennis players. But, you know, there's always ways to develop. But eventually, what I've seen happen and what I suspect would happen in these cases is the child on or adolescent on his or her own, it'll run its course and they themselves will decide, you know what, to get better at this, I'm going to have to spend 10 hours a day practicing tennis and it's not going to happen. I'm just, you know, I just think I'll just play occasionally for fun, like that kind of a thing, but let them wait it out because sometimes they will decide, you know what, I do want to be on the pro circuit. So I am going to start playing 10 hours a day. And guess what? I want to go to that private school in Florida for the rest of my high school. And here's what I, you know, like who knows, but I would kind of like wait it out. But um, in the meantime, you always can expose your children to more things and more diff you know, different things. Even if they're started on one talent trajectory, it doesn't mean they might have other interests and passions. So, you know, you've got talent then you have interests and passions and passion doesn't always have to be a talent or develop into a talent. Got it. So I have we have a couple of questions in the chat. What if your child is really into video games and um, but you don't really like them to play video games? So how do you <laughs> encourage that? You know, you know, how can you encourage that interest? Mm -hmm. I will say I I whoever said this, I feel your pain because you know <laughs> ninth grade boys. You know, it, it's a it's a blessing and a curse. At least I know where he is, and you know, and, and I can hear what he's saying and stuff. But, um, well, I think things like that. Um, there's time to develop that into a passion when they're older. Like when they get into high school, there's different kinds of courses they can take that go along those lines with um, coding and that kind of thing. Like if they love video games that much, you'll be able to direct them kind of then. Right now, most likely, especially in this COVID time, it's probably their hobby and their social interaction. And I really, um, being honest, to I just stopped all parameters with, with my son because I've seen how hard he works all day um, on this online schooling um, and, you know, the way it is. And he doesn't get to be with his friends at school, you know, as you know, I'm speaking to the preaching in the choir here, everybody knows this. So his social activity is, you know, the online games. And so I still, um, when kids are younger, I would put limits if it's interfering with their sleep, if it's interfering with their grades, you know, those things I would put normal limits on. But um, if they're that passionate about it, there's actually gaming code classes that you could take or explore or you know, find information about. You can get him a book in coding from the library and say, you know what, you like this so much. I wonder if you can make your own game. Wouldn't that be really cool? What if you made your own game and then you could sell it to um, the Apple store? And you know, like we do have kids in our division who have done that, <laughs> like it is possible. So does that answer the question, Dr. Highland? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Uh, and similarly, we have another one that my child is passionate about computers and his games um, and does things that, you know, the parent could never do. Grades are great, so we don't have any problems there. Um, and does have outside activities, but 
the parents worried about the screen time. So, you know, he has fixed his own computer and he's really good at it. So do you, you know, does the parent encourage that? Is it, you know, how do you encourage that? And that's a similar question, but I think maybe a little twist on the, um, the response. Mm -hmm. It is a little twist on it. And um, what I will suggest is only what I've read from like CDC recommendations and the American pediatrician, like whatever that group is, they've put out some guidance about screen time. Um, I would say work with your pediatrician about the screen time. And my guess is he or she will probably say, you know, as long as it's not interfering with their sleep, their eating, their grades, and it's channeled and it's, you know, still monitored, even if you're letting them have more time, you know how much time they have on there and that kind of thing. Um, when I brought this to our pediatrician, he suggested we get those blue glass, those glasses to block the blue light. And so my son will wear those and that helps protect the eyes from that blue light that's emitted from the screens. Um, so there are some things you can put in place to mitigate any negative impact from that. But I would actually encourage the um, taking apart a computer and putting it back together again, trying to solve like coding type issues. Um, that kind of thing. That's, that's some really good stuff. And, um, you know, unfortunately, what comes along with it is, well, I got to test it out by playing these games, you know, so it's kind of um, a yin and a yang a little bit, but um, hopefully that gives you a little something to go on. Well, thank you. At this point, we don't have any um, other questions in the chat. If you have a question, feel free to put it in as we get ready to close and we'll make sure that we try to get to it before closing. I want to say thank you again for um, sharing your expertise with us, Dr. Colorado. I took away quite a few tips that I will go home and kind of try to put into, uh, to, to create some new habits in my own home. So <laughs> I really appreciate the strategies that you've provided today. Um, we will post this video on our school division website. So um, WJCC's, uh, not website, please forgive me, our YouTube channel. So that it's there for other people to view it. So if you need to go back and view it, or if, some, if you know someone who was not able to join us tonight, but would be interested, please encourage them to um, check out our YouTube channel. And since we do not have any additional questions in the chat with that, I am going to say good night to all of our participants. And I'm going to say thank you again, Dr. Colorado. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, thanks.